sense, but there's different ways of teaching. Now, I want to talk about some of the tracks on this CD. It occurs to me, though, speaking of teaching, um, and I almost forgotten this, mm. but the last time you did one of these, <laughs> it cost you your spot at Harvard. Now, it was your choice to leave, oh, yeah. and we'll talk oh, about yeah. that. But it just occurs to me, the last time you did one of these, Larry Summers, the former yeah, president of Harvard, true, didn't like it so much. Front page New York Times for days. You are at Princeton, in fact, one could argue, because of your last CD. <laughs> well, at least that first CD. And I did another one in between, yeah, but it wasn't the best seller. Exactly. You know? yeah, yeah. But no, sketches of my culture, I'm still very proud of it. Because see, for me, though, brother, my point of reference as an educator in the deepest sense is to try to unsettle minds and souls and motivate bodies and persons in such a way they can become forces for good. Mm -hmm. They can muster the courage to think critically for themselves, muster the courage to love, and muster the courage to hope. And that means then that even though I'm a professor at Harvard, the president's office and his judgment is not my fundamental point of reference. If I can con affect one brother or sister of whatever color on the block, mm -hmm. I would not have lived in vain. I would not have labored in vain. And so brother Larry Summers, you know, he's coming at me as well as an embarrassment in association with hip hop. I'm saying, well, what you talking about? That's a compliment for me. I'm trying to affect young people. But not for a Harvard professor. No, but that's his Harvard. I'm as much Harvard as he is. I had to tell him that in his face. Yeah. I said, I am as much Harvard as you are. It's just we got different Harvards. Mm -hmm. That's true in America. We were just in Mexico last week. We are as American as George Bush. Mm -hmm. But it's a different America. But it ain't going to take America from us because we got Martin, we got Louis, we got our parents and so forth and so on. Harvard's the same way. So we struggle over the legacy of Harvard, struggle over the legacy of America, and in the end, we are human. We struggling over the legacy of what it means to be human. Since you went there, um Barack Obama running for president, obviously. You supporting Barack Obama. Um, Barack went to Harvard, as did his wonderful wife, Michelle. So many black folk in our society That's who true. are making Great. grand... W.B. Du Bois. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's historically and a contemporary sense. That's true. So many African Americans making monumental contributions. I've been educated at Harvard. You cannot hate on Harvard for producing um, contributors to our society. Steve McKeever, in fact, Hidden Beach, out of Harvard. Harvard Law Brothers. So, so, but here's the point, though, uh, the, the question at least. How did, you, how did you, how did you, from Sacramento, California, mm. how did you end up going to Harvard and not allowing an institution like Harvard, it's not so much about Harvard as it's about the Ivy League, how do you go into these grand institutions and allow them not to change you in ways that folk in your hometown can no longer recognize? Well, that's a good question. But you know, they used to say on the block that Harvard has ruined more Negroes and bad whiskey. <laughs> and there's something to that, too. You can get up there and get Harvard-itis, or Yale-itis, yeah. Princeton-itis, or whatever. Yeah. You know, Stanford-itis. Yeah. But no, I went in with this attitude. I got it from my dear father, late Clifton West. You have to go into a place, allow that place to shape you in the best of what it is, and you want to shape that place in the best of who you are. Mm. Because you got to change now. You got to change. The question is whether that change is going to be a form of maturity or whether it's going to be a form of uncritical deference and a kind of fanatic reverence without any serious engagement of what the history of that institution is. Harvard's got a white supremacist legacy. It's got a male supremacist legacy. It's got an anti-Semitic legacy and, and a homophobic legacy. It's also got a legacy that's critical of those legacies. Mm -hmm. So you choose to be a part of the legacy that's critical and Harvard has much to offer. At the same time, I was someone before I arrived at Harvard. I was deeply loved, bombarded by love. Mm. My family, Shallow Baptist Church, Willie P. Cook, Reverend H Deacon Hinton, and so forth and so on. Loved by Little League coaches. Loved by brothers and sisters in Glen Elder and so forth. I bring that baggage with me proudly, with dignity, standing like Sly Stone told us to do in the 60s and 70s, willing to take action with courage and compassion. So you get this fusion. And then the hybridity comes out, you know, mm -hmm. here come this new kind of person. Because remember now, paideia, going back to paideia, and the singing paideia on this thing, mm -hmm. it's a learning how to die in order to live more intensely, critically, and abundantly. Because when you die, you give up certain assumptions and presuppositions in order to be reborn into a higher level of maturity. It's like falling in love. Mm -hmm. Old self dies new self emerges entangled with another self. Or as a Christian, old self dies, new self emerges, now in many ways grounded on a gift of grace that makes you in some way a reborn being in a certain mm -hmm. sense. And that's what paideia is. When I, when I went to Harvard, I was willing to learn how to die to do what? To, be, to emerge stronger, more courageous, maybe more decent and loving because in the end, brothers, you know and I know, and I love your cup, Paul, 
Starbucks love wins, though, brother. That love is the core and center of it all. All the rest is sound of brass and tinkling cymbal, though, brother. Mm. And justice is what love looks like in public in the same way democracy is what justice is in practice. Mm. Love is at the core of it. And to be a black man, knowing that I come from a hated people, an abused people, to love myself without putting others down is so freeing and emancipating and liberating that you're able to live your life by trying to love through the darkness of whatever it is. Yeah. Wrestling with the catastrophic, wrestling with the horrendous, wrestling with the traumatic, because that's all we're doing. We're wrestling with the scandalous and the monstrous, and how do we love our way through that kind of catastrophic process? Birth, death, illness, breakup, on and on as we make our move from womb to tomb. Now, all that depth you just heard now is exactly what you get on the CD, but he does it uh, in a form that is danceable. Yeah, with a whole lot of friends, with a whole lot of friends. With Prince, of friends. though, brother. Prince. I want to go Let's there. say, Prince, just stand up. <laughs> just stand up, man. Say, Prince, would Prince you stand just stand up, up though, brother. Stand up, man. That's right. it. That's right. We're right. we talking about an unadulterated genius, man. All right. That, that's it. Let's start yeah. with the Prince track. Uh, I was saying that so much what the audience just heard is what they get on the CD, but in a danceable, yeah, that's entertaining, true. That's true. enlightening sort of way. That's true. Let me start there. I just want to pick three tracks right quick. The Prince track. Tell me about the Prince track and how you got Prince to do something he doesn't do, which is to yeah. appear on other folks' CDs. Yeah, no, he's never done that. Though, brother, it was such a, an expression of deep love for me that all I could do is just embrace it and say, brother, I love you back. Not just because you're a genius, not just because you're the artist among us in so many ways, but because your humanity is such that you figure that this would be such a force for good that you would be willing to allow me to work together and to do a kind of duet. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the idea, man, <laughs> in the parenthesis, Prince C. West, songwriter, I said, hey, dude, I'm ready to die, man. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I got my daughter, I got, you yeah. know, I got Zaytun, I got my son Cliff, who himself was a fascinating yeah. and powerful artist and writer in his own right, so I got people to stay around for. But at that point, you yeah. know, with Prince, man, because now J James Brown's gone, yeah. George Clinton is the only great funk master out there, really. And then you got Prince, man. So yeah. for him to be a part of this is uh, was quite moving, though, brother. I mentioned um, Andre 3000 earlier. Yeah, Andre on this. Yeah, I mean, and Andre, again, man, the love that Andre showed me, though. Brother Outkast, I think, the greatest hip-hop duo ever from ATL, from Atlanta, you know, for him to be able to reach out like this and do a thing together. Well, we talk about the nature of time, the nature of learning how to die, the nature of reborn right there in his song. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we mentioned Jill Scott earlier. Uh, let me let me jump into uh, um, well, let me let me just promote myself. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You <laughs> and Rob Dice. That's true. I was I was trying to skip around it, but we had to talk about everybody else. I was going to talk about Travis. Uh, <laughs> track, track number six on here. Track number six on here, which actually a lot of, I've been reading about the CD. A lot of folks have actually been writing about this particular track. Not because I'm in it, but a lot of people writing about it because of the subject matter. Track number six is a track called The N-Word. And it is, is, it is a, a conversation that I actually moderate 